I had a witness named Alan Raymer mm -hmm. who worked for the state of Washington as a wildlife research scientist. He did public outreach. He went to all the libraries and schools to talk about the wonderful variety of sea life that we have in the Pacific Northwest, especially in Puget Sound. So this man was a bona fide, educated scientist. Well, what happened to him? He saw something that I think is directly related to this crash, but it wasn't on the Sunday night. It was on the Monday night. And this is where it gets good. I titled this section in the book, the other search party. Welcome back. I am here with James Clarkson. James, welcome. Good morning. Thank you very much. All right. So today we're going to talk about an incident that occurred in 1979. It was a crash retrieval that you reported on. Before we get into that, just tell the audience a little bit about your background so that they have a better sense of your investigative ability and all that good stuff. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area back in the 60s, 1960s, mm -hmm. and I ended up joining the Army. I went into the military police. I ended up because the Vietnam War era was winding down, I got sent to Fort Lewis, Washington, which is okay. the side of Tacoma. Yeah, I've been there. Now it's, I think, Joint Base Lewis Fort Lewis McCord. McCord. Yeah, because it used like to be McCord Air Force Base and Fort Lewis butted up against each other. In fact, I know a hilarious story about that borderline. But... I became a plainclothes military policeman, and that was a great gig because I didn't wear a uniform for most of the time I was in. Was that and, CID? Was that the criminal no, investigation? No. That's the beauty of it. Interesting. We were kind of like street-level detectives to back up the MPs, and the fun part of it is I went to work wearing a sport coat, a tie, and I had a shoulder holster, handcuffs, and credentials that were issued by the Pentagon. And when you run around on a military base and you're dressed like that, everyone assumes that you're CID or military intelligence, or you could be FBI because they run around occasionally. Right. So since nobody knew that we were just MPs, people would always serve us and open doors for us and everything else. Well, who am I to dissuade them? So we accepted that courtesy and did our job. It was a great military police gig. I learned a lot. But they I still made you they still made you take an annual PT test and like Oh yeah, I did all that, qualified everything. The beauty of it was that when I got out of the army, which was in 77, instead of being like some people who got out and discovered that nobody wanted to hire a machine gunner. I was a uh, pretty experienced detective. I knew how to process crime scenes, take reports, interview and interrogate, do all of those basic skills. Well, being a young man, I wanted to get into civilian law enforcement. In Olympia, Washington is Thurston County. I mm -hmm. became a Thurston County Reserve Deputy Sheriff, then a correctional officer. I was anxious to get out on the street and prove myself and mm -hmm. so you take tests everywhere and i came out number one on the list in aberdeen washington and i was hired on as a patrolman on may 20th of 1979 in the far future soldiers of the starship supernova are thrown back in time cut off from reinforcements they crash land in earth's prehistoric past a plan is hatched to escape this primordial landscape. Menaced by dinosaurs and prehistoric beasts, it's a race against time in an ancient world. In the chaos that follows, they soon discover an even deadlier adversary lurking in the jungles, threatening to trap them all forever in the prehistoric wilderness. Triassic, available on Kindle, paperback, 
and audiobook. I went to work, and of course, when you're new, you don't see much daylight. I'm on the night shift, and I was a young man. I did not subscribe to the local newspaper. If mm -hmm. I had, on November 26th, 1979, that was a Monday, if I had looked at the headline, I would have fallen out of my chair because it said, UFO crashes in Elk River, question mark. And I should also back up a little bit since I've described one part of my journey. The other mm -hmm. part of my journey is that ever since I was a teenager, I was always interested in UFOs. And no, I do not have a personal close encounter. I wish I did. I've interviewed hundreds of people over the years because I ended up in MUFON. And I find myself frequently jealous of some of the witnesses I interview. And I think, wow, I wish that would happen to me. But all my life, I've been interested in this mystery. So I didn't see that headline when I joined the Aberdeen, Washington Police Department. But over time, as I became more comfortable, I became one of the guys, one of the regular officers. I was no longer just a rookie. I was more sure of myself. And I eventually let it out that I had this secret passion to know about UFOs. Mm -hmm. Well, when I did, I got all the jokes because cops love to kid each other. They will defend each other to the hilt, even to the death. But amongst themselves, with nobody else around, they are the worst gossips and practical jokers in the world. They're relentless. I got little green men in my locker, tinfoil hats, every kind of silliness you can imagine. But I gave as good as I got. And I could out-argue anybody on the subject of UFOs. And gradually, I started hearing these stories from police officers and deputy sheriffs. Everybody kept saying, something crashed by Elk River. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. Well, time goes on, and I kept hearing these stories, and a lot of things happened to me personally. I was further along in the department. I ended up married three small children, like many other people, sadly. I ended up with a divorce. It's not uncommon, especially in law enforcement. They say that the three things that all policemen have are a mustache, a motorcycle, and a divorce. I never owned a motorcycle. So I ended up meeting the love of my life, who, thank God, I'm still... Not, not to interrupt you, but they should. you should repeat that, but you should just say, pick two. Yeah. Yes, pick two. So I met the love of my life, who, fortunately, I'm still married to. We've been married for 26 years. But at the time I met her, she was the children's librarian. And I actually met her because of Bigfoot. This is true. I was up at the sheriff's office waiting to get a subpoena, and I saw this really attractive woman with this heavy box of stuff coming out of the sheriff's office. And there was a giant plaster cast of a Bigfoot print sticking out and all these things. Well, it turned out normally once a year, the sheriff of the county would come down to the Aberdeen Library and do a Bigfoot program. And it was mm -hmm. very popular. And he had props, and she would put out all Bigfoot-related books. And it was really interesting. Well, I thought, I need to help this lady to the car with that heavy box. So mm -hmm. I volunteer to carry it. I get to her car, and I look in the back seat. She had been planning a UFO program, so I see a bunch of UF books in the car. Well, by then, the universe is thumping me in the head, and I'm going, you know, you'd be really an idiot not to pursue this. It turned out it was a very good idea. Mm -hmm. And she told me about the Westport crash, too. And it turned out they had a file. 
the reason is they got asked about it so often, they went and dug up all the newspaper articles and kept them in a folder so that if anybody came in inquiring about it, they could make photocopies. Reference librarians are a tremendous resource, mm -hmm. and they love to help people if they're doing their job right. And all you got to do is ask, and they'll find things for you. To advertise on Through a Glass Darkly, email through a glass darkly ads at gmail.com. Well, I looked, there were five articles about this one event. And this, of course, is a small town paper. So they had the names of the witnesses. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, 1987, I joined the Mutual UFO Network. There was a very strong chapter of it in Seattle. And Larry and Marilyn Childs were the state directors. And behind the scenes was the man who did all the work setting up the venues and everything else. And his name is famous in UFO circles, and it should remain so, Peter Davenport. And mm -hmm. he ran the National UFO Reporting Center eventually. When Robert Gribble got older and decided to pass the torch, he gave it to Peter Davenport, which was a very wise decision. I ended up going to a few meetings, etc. And so I decided on my own, because I was a police officer, I had been to the state police academy, I had all the experience in the army, I immediately became a state section director for MUFON, and later still, I became the state director a position I held for 10 years. I took lots of reports. I probably investigated well over a thousand cases for MUFON, 700 of them personally, because you really don't have that many dedicated volunteers. So if you become state director, you end up doing most of the work yourself. Well, back to Westport. I decided to go out and interview the witnesses, and I did, because they were in the phone book. I called them up and said, I'm with the Mutual UFO Network. I'm extremely interested. Your name was in this newspaper article, and would you talk to me? So I talked to a whole series of people, and that led to even more people. And it mm -hmm. turned out that on November 25th, 1979, at 10.50 p.m., just outside of Westport, Washington. And I should explain, for the benefit of those who don't know anything about the geography, you have Washington State, the upper northwest corner of the United States, not counting Alaska, in CONUS, the continental United States, the main part, that's where I am, up in the upper left-hand corner. Olympia is the state capital. I-5 runs north and south throughout the state. And when you get to Olympia, if you turn left and head 50 miles towards the ocean, you come to Grays Harbor and Aberdeen and Hoquiam and Cosmopolis. And then there's this huge bay called Grays Harbor. And if you go to the north around the big curve, 25 or 30 miles, you get to Ocean Shores, Washington. If you go about 30 miles the other way, you get to Westport, Washington, which is the location that we're talking about. It's a small fishing town with about 5,000 people in it, very active commercial fishing, some boat building. So what happened at 10.50 p.m. on that Sunday night was that people started calling in what they had seen, and everybody agrees on part one. There's no doubt about part one. Part one is that some kind 
of fiery object came down from on high. People started seeing it 30, 40 miles from where it impacted. And it came down. And according to some of the witnesses, when it got fairly close to the earth, it made a maneuver, which would rule out meteorites. It made a turn right. in the air as if it was attempting to avoid either hitting the city of Westport or going into the Pacific Ocean. Part two of that is where there's controversy. Part two is that people reported that the next day, in fact, there were loggers. I interviewed loggers who couldn't have cared less about UFOs or what crashed. They bragged about how they stood up to these soldiers that were blocking the logging roads going into the area so that they couldn't go to work. So what that tells me is that the object must have been tracked. In order for the military to respond, since they would have had to have come from Fort Lewis or somewhere on the I-5 corridor, there's nothing military down here where mm -hmm. I was living. They must have already been in route or they would have never been able to respond that way because it would have already hit and it would take hours to mobilize people and put them into the area. Did anybody that you interviewed report any unit patches or anything like that that no. could positively identify? No. Any, pa any patches at all? No, I didn't get any of that. There was okay. one comment, as I recall, thinking back in the file, there was one comment that said that one of the loggers had a brief conversation with one of the guards who claimed to be from somewhere in the South. But I don't know from that conversation whether he was revealing a personal detail or if he was assigned somewhere in the South. It isn't clear. There wasn't enough information. Well, at the time, you obviously had Fort Lewis in terms of for the Army. Let's assume it's the right. Army if you're talking to soldiers. I think Fort Edward was probably still in that's full on the operation. Coast. That's way down. Yes, it would have been. Yeah, in California. In fact, that's South, where yeah. I went to basic training. It's way down on the California coast, though. We're talking a thousand miles. Yeah, I mean, the only way they'd be able to, I mean, even, I guess, even with helicopters, you're not going to cover that no, ground that quickly. That's way too far. They would have come from Fort Lewis, would be the most likely place. They could have flown in and then deployed in vehicles. But there are all these stories that all fit together. Like I had one man who reported, this is all he knew about the whole case other than what his neighbors gossiped about. He happened to have a phone booth down by the end of his driveway. Yes, this is long enough ago that there were phone booths all over. And he said the oddest thing was that he saw an unmarked government car pull up to the phone booth and an officer got out, a military officer. He said he remembered seeing the guy was in dress uniform and had the scrambled eggs on the visor, which would indicate he must have Very been high. field high grade. Ranking. Yeah. He got in there to the phone booth and made a call, and he was on the phone for a couple minutes, hung up, jumped in his car, and drove off. For folks in the audience who don't know what field grid means, that just means between a rank of major and full bird colonel. Right. Right. And there were all these odd little stories. We have the loggers who almost got into fist fights. I also interviewed some young men who bragged about how one in particular became one of the more controversial witnesses named Tuffy Miller. And, of course, you're talking about families that have all grown up together. They have a very, very small high school. They've gone through all the grades together, so they all knew each other really well. And Tuffy Miller, his parents owned a gravel pit that was right up next to the land area where the thing supposedly crashed. 
Tuffy Miller was out of school for a couple of days. When he came back, he said, they took my camera. And he was saying that he had snuck into the area because he knew all the trails and roads and everything because he grew up there. And he said that the military had grabbed him and taken his camera. And he said there was something in kind of a crash zone that he couldn't quite get a look at. And the weird thing was, I tried over the period of 10 years, once when I was doing the initial research, I tried to interview him. He wouldn't talk to me, but all of his relatives ratted him off. His aunt and everybody else, they said, I don't know what's going on, but he knows all about this. And the only thing that was kind of odd was that suddenly, within a few months, right after this crash event, his father was able to buy a brand new dump truck. Yeah. So there was an inference. You've got two ways to keep people silent. You either use the carrot or the stick. And apparently, this is the carrot. Now, when I came back 10 years later, I ended up speaking to his wife. He still wouldn't talk to me. And I found out through doing internet research that he was doing contract hauling for the Army Corps of Engineers. Funny that, huh? Yeah. So it kind of all fits together. So there were various stories about people seeing flatbed trucks hauling something out. There was unusual helicopter activity, etc. Everybody had a slightly different version. Interestingly enough, I talked to an Elma officer, a police officer who was off duty, driving with his family out by the beach in the area of Westport, and he saw military vehicles on the road. There is no reason for the military to even be there. It's not a place they would maneuver. It's either private property or now it's state-owned land. So there's no military facility out there. There was one man who was a sergeant with Grace Harbor County Sheriff named Robbie Robertson. He was the sergeant that everybody liked. He was a very interesting man. He had a background in military intelligence during the Vietnam era. He was the guy who would debrief the SEAL teams that were deployed off the ship he was on, and he would debrief them after their missions. So he had a very high-level security clearance, and he remained in the reserves. Well, he heard all about this crash, and he kind of organized an unofficial search party to go out and prowl the logging roads down there. There's a whole slew of these old logging roads to try and find anything. There were lots of stories, but nothing definite. To this day, nobody is sure exactly where this thing crashed because the vegetation is so thick. Mm -hmm. Up here on the Olympic Peninsula is an area that's actually called a rainforest. Yeah, I mean, temperate it, rainforest. Right, yeah, right. there's a reason why Washington's called the Evergreen State. Well, it won't happen without a lot of rain. Mm -hmm. So everything grows really fast. There was an area that had been logged off, replanted, and that suddenly had a large area of alder trees growing up in it. Alder is a scrub wood, and if you clear an area of land, and you don't plant anything there, alder is usually the first thing that takes over. It's not very dense wood. It's terrible firewood. It's kind of like if a weed was a tree, it would be hmm. alder. Right. So that's as close as I could ever get to a crash site. I interviewed everybody that I could talk to, took their statements. The most interesting one was a lady out in Central Park, which is about three, four miles outside of Aberdeen on the highway that leads back to Olympia. And so it was right in the path of this thing as it went overhead 
and headed for Westport. She was taking care of her husband, who evidently was seriously ill. So he's asleep in the other room. She even remembered which Sunday movie of the week. She never got to see the end of it. It was Oh God with George Burns. Mm -hmm. And she didn't get to see the end because she ended up standing up and going to the picture window that faced west because she saw this thing come across the sky. Only oddly enough, her recollection was that it was moving slowly. I interviewed her a couple of times, and she had some kind of a strange experience. It's almost like she was psychically connected to the object mm -hmm. because she kept thinking, my God, they're in trouble. They're going down. And she saw this thing on fire moving across the sky. And she was consistent with everybody else in that because this thing was seen over such a long distance, two of the very important questions that I would ask everybody is, where on the compass did you first see the object? And where on the compass did you last see the object? And they mm -hmm. all lined up. If you put them on a map, you could see this huge curve of this thing going across the sky. The intersection, and, resection, right? From the yeah, area, right? it all works. Yeah. It was it all fit together. Everybody saw the same thing. But her impression was exceptionally vivid. She was a very interesting witness. She's passed on now, of course, as so many years have gone by. But is Tuffy still around? Yeah. He might be retired by now. Mm -hmm. Have you tried him again recently? Well, I did when I decided to write a book about it. Mm -hmm. And then I had my stellar witness. When I had a lot going on in my life when I was investigating this initially, because I was a young married man. I had three small children. I was a police officer. I mean, it's just trying to juggle UFOs in with all this. I managed to, but... Actually, UFOs were brought up at my divorce proceeding, that that was one of the reasons why I was a, a bad husband, etc. Oh, well. I'm not the first person to be vilified for liking UFOs, and I probably won't be the last. But I had accumulated all these witness statements. I put them in a file that I kept, and I had kind of written the whole thing off to thinking, well... Maybe it was just a failed test flight. Maybe McCord launched a missile, either deliberately or accidentally, and it went off course, and they came down and got it. And rather than admit that they had screwed up and that they almost dropped something on a small city, they took the easy course of action and pretended that they were never there. Mm-hmm. And the official explanations were hilarious. A helicopter with a burning exhaust manifold, that was the popular one. There was at one point an official search number assigned so that the Air Force could track if anybody was missing an aircraft. Well, surprise, surprise, nobody was missing an aircraft. And nobody described anything that looked like a small plane or a helicopter, which you could see routinely in the night sky. And I've seen them hundreds of times down there in the harbor. Not all the time, but frequently enough that I know exactly what one looks like. And it's an aircraft in the sky with the lights on it. And right, not, blinking, right. not particularly exciting. It certainly would never cause the uproar that this did. Interviewing the dispatchers that worked then. This is pre-911 era. This is where police departments might share a radio frequency. Everybody had their own dispatchers on duty at their station. We had dispatchers, Hoquiam did, the sheriff's office did, and people could call in with their emergencies, and they would dispatch fire or police. Well, that night, all the dispatchers who were working said, that the phones just lit up.
And you got to bear in mind that back in that day, this is before cell phones, etc. In order for people to report this, they had to think it was important enough that either they went home and picked up their own phone or they went to a phone booth and called it in. Mm -hmm. So it was spectacular, whatever it was. And I had one witness. I took his report. He sent it to me and I just stuck it in the file. And it wasn't until years later. In fact, I published the book the Westport UFO crash. And I, that was in 2014. So to get ready to put that book out there, I had to go through everything and check all the witness statements, etc. And my wife found this report in there. And this was the most amazing aspect which was that I had a witness named Alan Raymer mm -hmm. who worked for the state of Washington as a wildlife research scientist. He did public outreach. He went to all the libraries and schools to talk about the wonderful variety of sea life that we have in the Pacific Northwest, especially in Puget Sound. So this man was a bona fide educated scientist. Well, what happened to him? He saw something that I think is directly related to this crash, but it wasn't on the Sunday night. It was on the Monday night. And this is where it gets good. I titled this section in the book, The Other Search Party. He was driving home from Aberdeen to Westport, this highway about 25 miles long. He gets down to as far as John's River, and he sees several things simultaneously. He sees a big, strange light in the sky, and he sees cars pulled over, and people are outside of their cars pointing. So he pulls over, too. There's like a family and people standing there, they're all looking up, and he sees this huge, odd light. And it's got several lights behind it. He described it, as a wildlife scientist would, as a mother duck with her ducklings. This thing is going across the sky, and it stops. And then he sees all these other lights kind of taking up positions around the big light. And this is taking up a fairly large area of the sky. Mm -hmm. And they're all standing there. This doesn't look like anything they've ever seen. And while he's watching it, all of these lights take off in different directions with fantastic acceleration. And they're gone, along with the big light. It shoots up and it's away. So this man, this Alan Raymer, solid as a rock as a witness. I asked him, that, you know, can I reveal your name? Yeah, I don't care. I saw what I saw. I think there's a famous UFO documentary titled, I Know What I Saw. Many mm -hmm. witnesses say that. They know that they've seen something extraordinary that has no conventional explanation. So he was a fabulous witness. In fact, I videotaped him. And in return, he came over to our house for dinner. But his testimony never changed. He was completely unconcerned about whether anybody would ridicule him. He said, I was coming home from work like I always did. And this was extremely unusual. And he worked Monday through Friday. That was one of the first things we were trying to recall this event. And so it finally came down. He said, there's no way that I would have seen that at 10.50 p.m. at Sunday night because I already would have been in my apartment asleep getting ready for Monday morning. So we knew that it was him coming home from work, and it turned out that it was the Monday night. So that's where the investigation ends. That's 
as much as I have. I got the dismissal statement from the Army, which, of course, was a classic avoiding the question. Mm -hmm. The only thing they said is, we are not guarding anything in the Elk River. Of course, that's several weeks after the event. And, of course, and they, they were weren't guarding it. anything in Elk <laughs> River. They had already been and gone. That wasn't the point. So you can imagine in the courtroom, the attorney would jump up and, Your Honor, I object, non-responsive. But you can't do that with the Army because they're just going to, whatever their official statement is, like the official statement from the Air Force, we're supposed to just accept that and go, okay. So that's the Westport story. So have you ever been able to get a hold of anybody on the military side who was there? No. Do you suspect that there is anybody in the course of your research that might know? I don't really have anybody. I could go in there blindly and start looking, but since I didn't have any units, I don't know exactly where they're from. I don't really have a way to check it out. Yeah, I, I would guess. If you went far enough you could try to do a Roswell and get the general accounting office. But the problem you would have is that you would probably be buried in data. Because you could get accounting for a particular period of time, all the money that was spent, how and where. But I don't know that you would know what you were looking at. It would be overwhelming. And it probably wouldn't be clean data either. It would be exactly. kind of 19... 77 or uh, sorry, 1979 yeah it would be a mess and then during the course of this investigation were there any accounts of any bodies or anything like that only indirectly and some of that i'm glad i asked that question i expect you to say no <laughs> like, say well, more the reason i say that in a yeah. qualified way is that i think that some of these people and you run into this in the field of UFOs, people want to be involved. There are human motivations for how and why people report things. And it's not necessarily that they want to perpetrate a hoax. Mm -hmm. It's that they decide that they want to be important too. And they kind of get on the bandwagon and they want to be special. I call it disclosure mystique. And you have to worry about that when you investigate UFOs. You know, there's the scene in, I think it's Close Encounters of the Third Kind, where all the witnesses are in a room at the military base, and there's the one old timer who says, yeah, I once heard one of them, and it made a sound you wouldn't want to hear twice. People like to embellish their stories. And people mm -hmm. like to be the center of attention. And so you learn to just accept that, but you're careful about what, in other words, I learned this early on, and especially later on, when I worked as a detective sergeant. When I became a detective sergeant, I knew all kinds of people in town. That's why it was kind of sad when I finally left, because that whole network went away. But I knew all sorts of key people, nurses at the hospital, pharmacists, all the business people in town. And if I had a crime or informants out on the street, even, I'd give a guy a little break on something minor. And in return, I'd corner him later on and say, what do you know about this? You know, tell me something off the record. Mm -hmm. And they want to stay on my good side. so. They would tell me something. I get information from everybody. You always have this big file of unverified information. As an investigator, you have to have that to be effective. Mm -hmm. But there is a big difference between somebody told me something and somebody tells me something that is important enough that I put it on an affidavit 
for an arrest warrant or a search warrant. There's a huge difference there. Mm -hmm. And I have to always be aware of that. And when I investigate, I was taught a very simple thing, which I have used for every investigation. In order to be a good investigator, a detective, whatever, I believe that you have to be a little schizophrenic. And the reason is, I have this invisible person that's walking around with me wherever I go. And we're always having a dialogue. And the dialogue is, what would a reasonable man conclude if he was confronted with the circumstances, the testimony, and the evidence that is in front of me right now? That's not to say that what I get five minutes from now might not contradict everything I've learned thus far. But what can I safely and reasonably conclude right now? And then that tells me what my next step will be. And you take the next step and you look around and you reevaluate. That's how you do a good investigation. You're always reevaluating. And of course, when you are a detective, your supervisor is actually the prosecutor. You want to go sit down with the prosecutor. You might even bring him to the crime scene. You go have a powwow in the office and talk about your whole case. And the prosecutor will look at you and go, well, that's really interesting. But here's a list of things that I need you to do if we're going to prosecute this case. And that's your laundry list. And you take it out and you see if you can do all those things. And then you go back and hopefully you've reached the point where either you can dismiss it or the prosecutor says, I'm convinced, I'll file. And then you go forward with a criminal proceeding. Well, I apply those same rules and those same talents to investigating UFOs. That's why I'm willing to speculate with the best of them, but I try to make it very clear when I'm speculating. And mm -hmm. I think that my role you know, whatever value I brought to the field of UFOs, it's that I am rooted in that investigative process. And yet I still believe that this is an extremely important subject. Do I know exactly what it is? No, but I'm convinced by the overwhelming quality and depth and breadth of the evidence, this huge, rich history that we have about unidentified flying objects, I'm convinced that we are being contacted by some form of non-human intelligence that appears to exhibit a technological ability that we can't even get close to. The five observables that were described as to why a UFO is not like anything else. Now, I am using UFO, I guess, to be correct these days. I have to say UAP. That irritated me for a while until UAP changed once again. And it kind of became UAP 2.0. Right. For the first anomalous phenomena. And for me personally, this made me a lot more comfortable with the acronym. Also, it opened doors to me that were never opened before. The uh, whole field of the paranormal is changing. Yeah. And now I go to ghost conferences. Yeah, it's all connected. All of this stuff's connected. Exactly. And it's wonderful mm -hmm. because my wife, who is a retired hospice nurse, she was children's librarian when I met her, but along the way, because of a series of events, she decided to re-career. And in fact, I remember it quite acutely because I got disabled out of my police job by a bad knee. So I was in between jobs and she came home and said, I'm going to quit my job as a librarian and become a nurse. And I remember thinking, well, this is going to be interesting. It turned out it worked out really well. And she found the thing that she really loved to do. Mm -hmm which is very difficult and very meaningful. 
But all of these experiences kind of culminated together. So she became a tarot card reader and a palm reader and a psychic medium. So obviously she is welcome at ghost conferences, but I wasn't. And of course, she put up for years with me and my UFO antics. So she accompanied me to various conferences all across the United States. In fact, in October of 2010, I told the June Crane story in Paris, France, to a group called Le Repas Ufologique, which is a wonderful thing. A group of people who come from all over Paris and the environs, they meet once a month at a mall and they have a big dinner meeting and then they have a guest speaker. And the one truly awesome trip we've taken, we were in Paris for two weeks in October of 2010. And I thought, well, since we're there, I contacted the people and said, is there any chance I could be a guest speaker? And lo and behold, they had an opening. And it was wonderful. What a delightful audience. And of course, I discovered, as many Americans do, that quite a number of people in Paris, especially the more educated ones, they speak two or three languages fluently. Mm -hmm. So they wait to see if you'll attempt poor French, and then they will hit you back in flawless English. You know, that's just the way they are. And you got to mm -hmm. accept that. But they were wonderful. I've had the opportunity to talk about UFOs repeatedly in Roswell. Roswell is, you know, it's it for me. And in fact, the interesting thing about Roswell is that all roads circle back to that. Mm -hmm. That's where we formed the pattern of how the U.S. government responds to non-human intelligence and UFOs. And we are still fighting that battle even right up to February 2024, when that horrible report came out from the Aero Office, the uh, anomalous all-domain research organization. Just call it, just call it a counterintelligence operation, because that's I agree. Sean, that's all it is. Sean Kirkpatrick yeah. is a demon. He's the villain of the piece. You got to yeah. have one. Yeah. But it all fits together. All right, my friend, I think that probably is about the best place to put a pin in the interview. And thank you very yes. much for sharing this story. I'm sure the audience will enjoy it. It's fascinating. And yes. you know, who knows if we'll ever, we'll ever learn what the truth is about this stuff. I don't think I can do it right now. But if you are interested, I couldn't go away from this without talking about June Crane and her remarkable story. That's another long shaggy dog story in and of itself and she was one of the most important people i ever met so i think maybe this would be a great subject for another episode i 100 percent agree and hopefully we we do discuss that i will can, talk to you yeah. soon my friend all right you take care thank you sean if you enjoyed today's video please hit like and subscribe and also hit the notification button so you can be notified whenever I post new content. Thank you. Now, if you're enjoying the channel and you want to support it, there are several things you can do. In fact, there are five things you can do. The first thing you can do is just buy my books. I got plenty of books out in the market right now, and I would prefer that folks buy a book rather than give me direct support because they get something out of it. They have a real tangible product. The second way you can support me is by becoming a member on YouTube or becoming a patron on Patreon. And just go to either site and it'll explain everything. third way you can support the channel is by checking out my merch site. 
just here. There's plenty of stuff that you could get to support the channel. And I'd appreciate that you, you have it and can wear it. Not only do you help support the channel, but you also help promote the channel, and I appreciate that. The fourth way that you can support the channel, and this is really easy, is anytime you want to buy something on Amazon, literally just go to the description below and click on any link, literally any link. The channel gets a cut of that, and it costs you no extra money. You just go through the link as I'm part of the Amazon Affiliates Club. The fifth and final way you can support the channel is through donations. Now, I don't prefer these because it's more of a expression of gratitude, but you don't really get anything out of it as a subscriber to the channel. However, if you decide to do these options, there's two options. There's Buy Me A Coffee, which is a separate site. And there's also, you can go through YouTube with either a Super Chat, a Super Sticker, or a Super Thanks. Again, I prefer Buy Me A Coffee because that organization takes less money than Amazon does. But either way, I appreciate any support you, you are willing to give the channel. So thank you very much and keep watching. I really appreciate it.